Right, I'm delighted to say Sarah Dunham is with us to talk hurling in the weekend's uh, hurling league action. It's harder for us to get meaningful stuff from the hurling league than it is in the football league. Um, and yet, there's definitely some bits and pieces that are important. Uh, you were at the Dublin Tip game. Yeah, so we spoke last week about Tip and I was wondering, did they have depth? And they answered that. Brian O'Mara's in, Garrod O'Connor at centre forward, scored four great points. As well, the bench. Late on, they had Seamus Callan to come in, Noel McGrath to come in, and Bonner Mart to come in. It's not bad, is it? No, and like if you look at the Dublin setup, they didn't have the same depth. They have a, they have a team, they have a structure, they have a core, but the players that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, the likes of Liam Rush, Chris Crummy, those are the guys that Dublin don't have coming in now, where Tip do. Um, we are talking to Anthony Nash on Fridays on Off the Ball, and he was talking about Brian O'Mara and. Uh, like he was, I haven't heard somebody who's coached a player offer as much praise up for somebody as he was effusive. Like he's your solution at six, he's your solution at three, he's your solution wherever you need a solution. And um, not many counties have that. Uh, you know, another Brian O'Mara in Tipperary as well. But what was so good and so impressive about him? Well, it's it's his positioning. So and his reading of the game. And I know Anthony was mentioning his personality and attitude, but outside of that, he's an out-and-out hurler. I suppose another hurler that I would be, say is similar to him is Dermot Ryan from Clare. That type of player who can play across the line. Um, Ronan Marr, uh, Mark Coleman in Cork, they're just players who are very comfortable in front of the ball and distributing the ball, yeah. like Barry Nash. Yeah, and it, um, we kind of got into it a little bit about how um, you know Limerick essentially play with t- a two-man full forward line and then somebody dropping deep. And if you just have your old traditional three backs and you're not really accounting for that. And so the modern defender needs to be either one week you're going to be a man marker, but mm-hmm. then another week you're actually not. You're going to end up with loads of ball and you need to be really good at it. And that's where your reading of the, the game needs to come in. And maybe we don't fully appreciate that until the last 15 minutes of an All-Ireland quarterfinal, semi-final, final. Because of the distribution. So if you look at Barry Nash yesterday for Limerick, I suppose that's what Brian O'Mara offers tip because he's comfortable in that spot. Nash yesterday was picking out uh, Darrow Dunham in midfield. Darrow Dunham's finding Tom Marcy and all of a sudden it's the easiest score of the game. So Tip, by doing that, by having a player in that position, because Michael Breen had been there for the last two weeks and I suppose he offers you the more Garb McInerney style, you know, strong you, physical you, you fullback. Them, you need them all, mm. it turns out. You need a combination yeah, of all to these. To be able to push forward. But ultimately, if you can't get the ball out of your backs, you're, you're given a kind of a 70-30 ball in favour of the opposition. You need to be giving a 70-30 ball in favour of your opposition you know so that's what's key uh, Will O'Callaghan was saying that Bonner Mar had been playing full forwards for the earlier stages is this an experiment is this where he has some kind of future what What do you think oh, I, I love him at 11 I just think his vision is incredible there's still a goal from 2019 that's one of the best goals I've ever seen that he was involved in um, I think from Tipperary's point of view the options the last night, that big, strong half-forward line, Seamus Kennedy scored two points, I said Garrett O'Connor scored four points. That inside, that six tip um, forwards, before Callan and Bonner ever came on, they were all on the scoreboard. And that's what you're looking for with tip is a spread of scores. By comparison, Dublin were heavily reliant on Donald Burke. He scored 14 points. He ended up getting the man of the match, which is hard to do on a losing team. Yeah, But that's how, I suppose, uh, effective he is. But I think Dublin, by comparison, didn't have that same spread of scores. Um, what what's success this year for Dublin? Like what? Well, at the end of the year, we all done who sits down and goes, "Okay, that was a good year." What what will it have been? Well, I would say, looking at Wexford yesterday against Clare, you'd be thinking that Dublin would fancy themselves now to go into third spot. They, you know, that they would qualify out out of the Leinster Championship into the All-Ireland Championship based on the last three games. I think they're definitely further ahead of Wexford. Wexford have a raft of injuries and long-term injuries at that. So, you know, they got an awful trimming from Clare yesterday. So I think Dublin will be very happy knowing that they have a, a three, a six, Chris O'Leary in midfield for Dublin. Um, Donald Burke, if that injury yesterday, he came off after 61 minutes on Saturday. Um, if, they, if Dublin were to lose Donald Burke... Wexford and Dublin could be on par. Well, only two of their six starting forwards scored him Saturday. Then you had Sean Curry come in. Then you had Paul, you know, Paul uh, Crummy come in. I know, I, I know it's a worry, but I really like Alex Considine. I think uh, Kian Boland probably wasn't as clinical as he was against Waterford. I thought Dublin were much more assured against Waterford than they were against Tip. Um, but they're still very busy and they're learning. You know, it's a, it's hard in the, in that first year to to knit. 
Uh, let's talk about Limerick. So they ended up five point winners against Galway. Yeah. A bit of controversy about Kyle Hayes not getting sent off, at least for a second yellow, although it's probably straight red when you smack somebody in the face with the hurl. Is it a straight red these days? I don't know. I mean, it's a ma- it's a manly sport, apparently, we keep getting told, where you're right. supposed to just take this shit, right? Well, I wa- I watched I watched the incident. I saw where uh Concanon obviously it's it's a, it's a dunk beforehand it's there? an awkward pull right and it's an awkward pull and it goes across his shin now anyone who gets a wallop on the shin right <laughs> from right finish that go on the reaction the reaction would be one of hurling people here yeah. frustration yeah, okay and, and how would you how would you take that uh, frustration out Sarah uh, Smack. That's just that's just something that can't be accounted for in the rules. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> like the pain that there's, goes through your shin. There's the rules and then there's the hurling rules, <laughs> and we all know that you're allowed to smack somebody across the face. Yeah. Is that is that what you're, you're not, shin. You're absolutely not allowed to smack somebody across the face. But if I was to get a wallop in the shin with no shin guard on, that's the pain. The frustration is something that you it's just automatically. Can't, it, it's sickening, right? It is sickening. But that's what. Okay, there's a rule book there for it. Uh, the linesman it was on the sideline the linesman should have seen it so there's a pair of them in it um, Kyle Hayes' reaction was silly okay he he said he's a long time in the game he, he should have been able to restrain himself he didn't he got away with it and then he wins the free late on it's not meaningless in the end of, of the you know so absolutely Limerick seemed to have Galway at arm's length for the majority of the game but if there'd been a sending off mm-hmm. You never know what, what would have happened. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Galway didn't deserve to win that game, okay? Limerick were head and shoulders above them in terms of their um, movement, their communication, even their physicality. And Anthony Nash spoke on Friday about winning moments in games, you know, as opposed to uh, increasing your purple patches, but specifically moments in games. And there was a moment in the first half where Galway looked like they were kind of coming off the field. Darrow O'Donovan thumped Jack Grealish and I felt it in my bones. It's they were just repelling Galway. Like that physicality was incredible. And Galway, if they had won that game, it would have been a steal. So for me, Galway yesterday, they have no forward movement. Their their forward play is very, very weak. It's a bit mad, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, like we would expect it now again, you know, uh the game being played in February is not the same game that'll be played at the end of April and May. Although it's close enough, it's probably closer than it has been in previous seasons. Like we expect Galway to come through and be in an all quarter quarterfinal at the very least, right? So how do they go from this static forward play now to being better in June? Well, you've one of the best forwards in the country as their manager. I'm surprised that that seems to be the thing that was most lacking yesterday. They genuinely didn't know who was moving into a pocket and the person who was most frustrated was Conor Whelan. He just physically couldn't find space or couldn't get on a ball and some of the ball that he distributed himself was very poor. So the communication within the Galway six isn't there yet. And for me, if I was Henry Shefflin, I'd be opening the playbook today and saying, right, how do I get these players moving into pockets? They'd one score um, early on, and you'll remember it. It was Conor Cooney's chance for a goal, which was actually the only goal in the game. Um, and he comes onto it at pace. He's an incredible touch, and the ball is played out into the left-hand side and it's the little dink pass and he's through he breaks the line but at no other point in the game did Galway look like they were going to break the line and can they look at Limerick yesterday and how the Limerick forwards move and how they pick up pockets of space and, and learn something from that or are Limerick just so far ahead skill wise that actually Limerick's the majority of Limerick scores came from out around the 45 yesterday mm-hmm. they got 20, 25 points yesterday and, and it was they, they were in between like in between the 65 and, and the 45 um, I, I was surprised at Limerick actually that they didn't break the line yesterday so what they seem to be doing and Shane O'Brien is excellent at it he comes out he wins the ball and then he's feeding back the field Tom Morrissey uh, Key and Lynch who picked up three points that's where Limerick are a little st- Surprised this year in that they're not going for goals, and I don't know—is that because they're they're playing three? Act- they're actually playing three across the line rather than in the full forward line, in two inside. Right, okay. And get, uh, Flanagan, and I'm I'm sorry to harp on about this, but the poor devil is missing Galan no end because he got a point yesterday late on. His I'd say this is the lowest he scored in the league in a number of years. You know. Uh, to, before we go back to Limerick, mm. what do what do Galway do in training over the next month to make sure that they begin to get that deep understanding of how 
each other can create space for each other um, I think that comes from their midfield so the the distribution yesterday from their half backs and midfields wasn't uh, fast enough so I think you're looking at your midfields you're looking at the likes of Sean Lennon and you're looking at kind of I suppose uh, restricting the space um, pulling pulling the Galway forwards in t- towards the goal and leaving that space so that they can run out into the pockets and then have the likes of Conor Cooney coming in at 11 because he's so physical and so direct he needs to be coming through the centre and the boys need to be playing him in Okay from Limerick's perspective mm. the um the, uh, the Tom Morrissey bravura performance I didn't realise he was such a, a brilliant free taker uh, I guess maybe they um, have just a long line of free takers who are able to, to do what he's d- doing at the moment um, uh, Galan aside are we seeing anything different or are they just getting better at what ha- they've always been really good at um, I I think yesterday their distribution was heading to shoulders above uh, above Galway. It's just those little pockets of space. It's the comfort. It's the twenty yard pass. So that pass from Barry Nash to Darrow Donovan, and then he flicks out to uh, Tom Morrissey for the score. But like, if you look at Kyle Hayes at at left half back, and then you look at Tom Morrissey outside him, they scored what like you know seven to ten points between them yesterday at their ease. Yeah. Um, if I was playing against them. I'd be going, lads, I'm going off on, I'm going in right half hour there. I'm not dealing with these boys. <laughs> like That left side is lethal. It's, I hadn't seen them be so efficient uh, up that left side. That, that was their, that was the winning of the game yesterday. Um, where do you think Kyle Hayes starts in, say, the All-Ireland semi-final or final this year? What position? It has to be left back. Do you think so? It has to be, yeah. Right. Yeah. They've got so, like, they've, they've got so many options up front and with, with Keane Lynch now at 11, it's, it's if he wasn't there, you could see him, you know, slotting in at eleven. But but he's so good there; he can run the game from there. From from mm. seven, yeah, he can run the game from seven. It's and and what's what's interesting is, he he's really good at um, reading the play. So he'll he'll hold his run, and then at the last second he'll bypass the Galway midfielder, which he was doing yesterday. And they're going, where where did he come from? You know, so he loves to get forward, and he's unmarkable. The, the ease at which they pass it short, like mm. there was a few occasions yesterday where Nicky Quaid goes short to Richie English, yeah. goes on to Dan Marcy, and every time their body shape is perfect, they're not taking any risks, there's no chance at all that they're going to drop it, they're protecting themselves in case there's a forward coming in, putting some pressure on. Uh, why is it that they feel, it, when you watch them and the short passing, which should be one of the most basic parts of the game, they look so much more comfortable than every other every other team? Look, it's, I think hurling is about repetition. It's literally drilling that the simplest of, of actions is is holding on to the ball. And Galway yesterday kept dropping the ball, allowing Limerick to step on them. If that's if that's the thing that allows you to get out of uh, out of difficulty, right? Limerick have targeted that. And if you saw yesterday as well, every time a player from Limerick was on the ball, they were going they were coming forward four and five in a row. So there was there was literally they they like run like a, a semicircle and they're all running together. Mm. So every fella knows he can take four steps and he has an option right or left. It's it's just so neat. Um we we we're kinda in that phase that we were in with the dubs a couple of years mm. ago where it's like who's who's gonna beat them, how are they gonna beat them? Can anybody beat them? And at the moment we don't really see anybody who's putting together a, a body of evidence to suggest that Unless it's going to be like a smash and grab, bit of a fluke. Look, if 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 you allow Galway to stay in that game yesterday, which Limerick did, I don't know how Galway stayed in that game, but on 67 minutes, Galway were two points down. And then there's indis- indiscipline. Kyle Hayes should have gone off and Limerick would have been down to 14 players and potentially could have lost that game. Okay. So it's Limerick's to lose because that indiscipline as frustrating as it is to get a wallop in the shin, um, it's not worth, you know, losing games. And that's particularly later on in the year, yeah, yeah, because yeah. Garrow Takerty um, gave way free as well, which brought Galway back to two. It's it's those kind of it's that calmness under pressure that they probably didn't show as much of yesterday later on. The uh, Cork footballers were the real stars of the show, and the double header <laughs> uh, um, scoring six goals. Uh, the hurlers only scored two, and um, they they kept Westmeath in the game like hard for the Cork Herders at this stage to uh, get as excited about this league game as they have been about some of the other league games because the, the performance has been excellent so far so um, was this a bit 
uh, complacency or were they trying something else or is this one of those weeks where they do a really hard block of training and they just they, they kind of they don't really care about the results but there was a cohort of lads there made their debuts for Cork which is incredibly exciting for those lads so for those lads it meant the world to be in Park Kiev yesterday but obviously that has an impact on the momentum that Cork had built over the last two weeks um, the Bars won the county last year right um, and yesterday four of the Bars lads got an opportunity to play together. Right. Um, Connor Callan, Ethan Toomey, um, Brian Hayes, uh, Re- and Ben Cunningham, right, Jerry Cunningham's son. So they scored six points between them. Um, that's a big return from uh, a, a very young set of players. Um, and that's really positive because that, that was their first opportunity and they took it. Uh, he kept a bit of, I suppose, consistency in there in that Shane Kingston was in, he scored 1-7. Uh, Shane Barrett scored 1-2. But it was that period after halftime where they scored three points in 15 minutes. That's not good enough. So that'll be what Pat Ryan will target in a couple of weeks or in the next couple of weeks to say, okay, we need to keep the scoreboard taking over. You need to go probably six to eight points in that 15 minute spell. It can't drop to three. Um, We've been talking about the widening of the panel Mm. and more clarity of purpose about what everybody is being asked to do. And so far it feels like you you think anyway that they're getting more decisions right than wrong at the moment yeah and look there was I think 10 different clubs represented again yesterday um, from Newtown Shandrum with Cormac O'Brien uh, to Newcastle with, with um, Luke Mead he has spread the net so wide and there's so many players come through he's looking at 40 to 45 players you know across uh, the, the length of Cork which I think is really exciting and it's hard to bed that down to, to like so you've got to keep sifting and sifting and sifting to get to the, the bit where your match day squad is ready to go in it's only six weeks now is it? Mm. I mean, yeah. Like, that's right. Yeah. Well Liam Griffin was on last week and he was talking about you know producing more players to bring up the quality. Yeah. That's what has to happen in Cork. You have to produce more players to bring players up to the quality so there'll be there'll be you know what's the collateral damage and there'll be lads will only get so far but it'll allow is this a multi-year project like in their heads do you think or are they thinking that there's a possibility that you know a team can flare out the way like it has to be a multi-year project if you saw Dan Morrissey and Tom Morrissey yesterday in their post-match interview very wholesome interview two very wholesome men the conditioning of Dan Morrissey lads like Cork don't have that right now so they need two years of putting on that bulk to be able to Were the Rimmick lads that. taking their tops off again? Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't need to. <laughs> the, like, the tight, tight jersey. It's, kinda, it's, um, it's, it's always accidental, isn't it? Yeah, I'll, take, I'll take the smaller top. <laughs> well, they were... Let's just release the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very impressive. But I'm talking about their conditioning and what it allows them to do. Dan Morrissey caught a ball out of the sky yesterday at six. Declan Hannon wasn't even playing well, yesterday. Well, that's what I'm trying to work out. So if yeah. Kyle Hayes is playing... Is Declan Hannon not playing? Oh, no, I would, I would, I, okay, and this is... Oh, you mean pick him at a... I would say Dan Marcy may end up at three. Okay. So Richie English is playing at three at the minute. Um, I would say Dan realistically will play at three, Declan at six. Um, right, and then... Jeremy Burns again, at yes, five. They're only bringing on Gerald Hegarty with 15 minutes to go. I know, I know. They're just making sure that everybody is... Yeah, now I suppose if you look at, if you look at yesterday, um, a couple of instances under the high ball... Limerick weren't as good out on the right yesterday under the high ball so you can see where Garrow Tagerty will plug back in without with his ease There is part of this where everybody should try and watch as much of the Limerick hurlers as they possibly can because it's like all time great team playing all time great stuff and still in that sweet spot of desperate to break the records and have all the I don't really believe in hunger as a thing like I think the best teams generally win because they're the best teams but they still have this insatiable desire to uh, be seen to be the best and to break all the records that Kilkenny have set in the past. And well, yeah, as as evidenced by and the dubs. Donovan yesterday. I think, I, yeah. I think the dubs are in their sights. I don't think that um, they want to be the first hurling team to do five. They want to be the first GAA team to do whatever. You know. Yeah, I I think it's I think it's there for them. I think as a group, the I suppose the only sticking point now is Gillan. So whether Gillan will be back for championship or not. Um, there's eight weeks there. He was playing soccer last week, by all accounts. So, at least he's fit. <laughs> soccer fit. <laughs> well, look, I think they haven't. They've only scored one goal in three games. So, um, I, I think they. It'll be mutually beneficial for everybody to decide that now is the time for him to come back. I I miss him anyway. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah, didn't even mention Wexford. Got to give one line. Holy Jesus. <laughs> yeah. He did 4-17 in the first half. Yeah. How the hell do you come back from that? Well, you have to hope that it's a one-off and that next week somehow they fix it because mm. otherwise they're on the verge of slipping into irrelevancy again, which we thought, we'd, we thought they'd fixed. They have uh, massive injuries, long-term injuries. Uh, Claire were playing like angry men yesterday in that first half. Obviously, Tony Kelly was back. Uh, Conlon was back at six. They looked more like themselves, but... Wexford weren't even tracking them. At one stage, David Reedy headed off up the line to get his goal and it was like a... If Clare hadn't had the letdown in last year's All-Ireland semi-final, we'd be talking about them as contenders now because of what they did to Limerick in mm. Munster. That, that maybe, maybe we just need to forget about that and the truth about Clare is their performance in the Munster final and actually they're the ones who we should be thinking about as the potential to knock off Limerick. Uh, but they certainly looked more like... The I suppose the performances that they had last year and Peter Duggan and um, Mark Rogers got a great goal it, it, they were I, I'm not going to take anything from it because Wexford just didn't show up yesterday yeah. bar Conor McDonald's class goal but you know that's that was needle in a haystack stuff yesterday for Wexford OK uh, a couple of quick comments for you from a little bit earlier on some credit for Westmeath better performance compared to other games it's just hard to give Westmeath and to a certain extent Antrim credit for those games until they start winning them uh, Graham Shaw says Manchester United overachieving really look at your wage Bill Andy biggest spenders should win but they've always been the biggest spenders mm. over the last decade or so and they've always been terrible so. yeah I think what the, the big spending has done is given them a good base of players but clearly they've needed the You're right United manager fan. as well United fan. a long time United fan and uh, feeling feeling it. It was the milk cup, wasn't it? Look, it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. I love that Casemiro got the header. I, I, you know, he's my new Kincheskis. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we uh, in the, uh, I was playing uh, Sarah in FIFA last week in the uh, Virgin Media Games room, and uh, she said that Andrew Kincheskis was her favourite Manchester United player growing up. I said she was the first person I've ever met from Cork who didn't say Roy Keane. It was 1994. It was Roy hadn't, you know, made himself as relevant as he is now. <laughs> You're just revealing her age there, Nathan. Very... Well, the milk cup, I think, revealed her age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, we're come, we've come from awful heights down to being relieved over a trophy yesterday. This is the staging post, though. It does feel like it's the start of something as opposed to... Um, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 100 million for Anthony is not good recruitment. They only got Casemiro when the Rabio deal fell through. I'm not convinced of Ten Hag's recruitment just yet. Rashford's form is overshadowing this, says Niall Daly. I think we don't know on all of that yet. We don't know if 100 million for Anthony is too much. The money is somewhat irrelevant for Manchester United. And is this Rashford's form or is this just Rashford now? Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, they, this is just him. Like, there's no reason why he's not a 35, 40 goal in all competitions striker yeah. for the next two or three years. Ten Hag is making Wan Bissaka look like a footballer. So I think that's the thing. That's, isn't the, it? that's the key. You know, he has his Varane and Casemiro absolute elite. He's brought in players that he knows in Anthony and Lissandra Martinez. But he's made Wan Bissaka, Shaw, <laughs> Rashford. He's brought them to a level that nobody thought possible six months ago. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. Uh, Nathan needs to watch Man United a bit more. You, Nathan, basically the theme of. Uh, I watch, the I watch uh, Manchester United every every weekend. Tune into off the ball on Sundays. Whether Ireland losing the quarterfinals again doesn't take away from a series win in New Zealand and a potential Grand Slam, says Leonardo da Vinci. Nice of you to um, get that message in uh, six months early. There you go. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day.